So Pat, I want to thank you for that incredible introduction. I want to give great honor as well to your chairwoman of this incredible party. Sarah, I think I hear her be called the, the James Brown of county chair people. Because she's like the hardest working chairperson out there. Um, so I can't tell you what this means to me. I literally go to call my mom, who's in Nevada, and tell her that uh, not only do I get great love and support down in the Vegas area, my mom lives in Summerlin, um, but that there is a great energy in the Democratic Party up here as well. And I want to try to jump in as quickly as possible and get some questions and hear about the issues that you all care about. Everywhere I go, I get a chance to learn a little bit and hopefully let you all know what I will do as your president. Um, I want to talk about a lot of issues, from veterans issues to climate change to criminal justice system to jobs, the economy. I'm hoping we have a chance to have a robust conversation. I have a lot of ideas I've been unveiling recently, like this outrageousness that we've had in our country, where we are, my mom has this saying, she goes, it's kind of embarrassing, she says, behind every successful child is an astonished parent. <laughs> Well, I'm really upset though that we have this nation where the tradition has always been that every generation astonishes their parents, going further, farther, even more. But now we have this point where my mom's generation, baby boomers, about 90% of them, 95% of them did better than their parents economically. And now for millennials, it's down to 50%. We, we have this nation where my father's generation, baby boomer generation, even working a full-time job at minimum wage, were above the poverty line. Now there is not a county in America where a family working minimum wage could afford a two-bedroom apartment. We, we are, are at this sort of distraught present and we need to have ideas, practical ideas, that can start addressing these issues. This is why this week I came out with a very big plan just saying, look, enough of these bank shots where we think if we just give the wealthiest people trillions of dollars of tax cuts, yeah. somehow that's going to trickle down and help everybody else. Yeah. Come on. If you want to help, and the Republicans in the Senate kept telling me, well, this is going to pay for itself because it's going to grow the economy. Well, no, it's not. It's not stopping the trends where our corporate wealth is an 85-year <laughs> high and wages are a 60-year low. The way you want to do it is in a society that is a 85% of our economy is driven by consumption, well, give direct tax breaks to struggling families who are the main consumers in the first place. And so the big idea is hey, let's take the earned income tax credit model, but let's massively expand it to make sure that every family, if you have a working couple making less than $90,000 a year, you qualify for the credit. You can get up to $8,000, individuals $4,000 back. Imagine you're making $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 a year. You can get $4,000 more back to lift your income. This plan alone would lift 154 million Americans of uh, salaries. It would take over 15 million people out of poverty. One in two Nevada workers, workers would see their, their incomes going up. But more than that, I know my mom here in Nevada, when my parents moved here, my father had Parkinson's. He had Parkinson's onset dementia and had a stroke, and my mom was his primary care, caretaker. How many of us know people that are taking care of someone who's ill or or ailing. I mean, there's so many hands are going up. Well, when you all know that that's work. And in my bill, those folks would qualify for a tax credit as well to relieve their stress and their demands of $4,000. Students, right now the earned income tax credit doesn't cover kids, young folks, 18, 19, 20, 25, to the mid 20s, you don't qualify for the earned income tax credit. That's crazy. We should make sure that they qualify for the $4,000 too. There's people here that know folk that are 65 years or older that are still working because their meager social security checks don't go far enough. That's valued work as well. And they should qualify for the tax credit. There are practical things we can do in our society that go back to investing in the things that our forefathers and mothers invested in. We became the number one economy on the globe because we invested in each other. We invested in work with dignity. We invested in our infrastructure, heck, we are a nation now that is about to be the first nation that has inherited from our parents the best infrastructure on the planet Earth, we had the best house on the block, and then we trashed it and we're about to hand over to our kids well, over two trillion dollars of infrastructure debt. And what do we have? Like we have here, still debates going on about rail in the West where we know it would be great economic development. The busiest rail corridor in North America is on the East Coast and it runs half an hour slower than it did in the 1960s while, while China has built 18,000 miles of high-speed rail. How can we stand around and watch 
The nation that used to invest in its infrastructure, invest in its people, now is being outdone by our developed nations who are out investing us in each other. Universal preschool, prenatal care, we have fallen way behind that we lead the planet Earth now for developed nations in infant mortality and maternal mortality. I want to get our country back to doing what we should do, which is continuing the traditions of every single generation, making a more perfect union. And I emphasize that word union because it is about us coming together and doing the things that make us a stronger and better nation. Look, I want to talk about a lot of issues here, but I want to let you all know why I get up every day and feel blessed to be running for president of the United States. I get a chance every single day, not just talking to the ideas that matter, I'm a bit of a policy wonk, but the spirit of our nation, which is getting distorted in this generation, where tribalism is deepening, where you turn on the TV and it seems like people have forgotten what our founding commitments are. I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to whitewash and cover over the problems of our past. Our founders were imperfect geniuses. I say they were imperfect because, look, they wrote a lot of the bigotries of the time into our founding documents. Native Americans are referred to as savages, the Declaration of Independence. Women are second-class citizens and did not have equal rights. African Americans were fractions of human beings. But these men were geniuses because they broke with the course of human events. We are the oldest constitutional democracy on the planet Earth. We said this nation was not going to be founded because we all prayed alike or looked alike or shared an ethnicity. That we were going to be the first nation to put into our documents the highest ideals of humanity that we're going to challenge every generation to make those ideals real. That every generation didn't just salute the flag. They fought to make real on those words, liberty and justice for all. And look what they said in those founding documents. They knew it wasn't going to be easy. The Declaration of Independence ends with a Declaration of Interdependence. This idea that if we are going to make it as a society, since we're not bound by a common religion or a common ethnicity, that in this country, we have to make an unusual commitment to each other. That's why the Declaration of Independence ends with the Declaration of Interdependence. It literally says in the document, these men who put this word, this document together, they said, if we're going to make it as a country, at the very end, read those last words, we must mutually pledge, pledge to each other, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Turn on cable TV tonight and see about that sacred honor. What's happening? <laughs> Look at the way we talk about each other. The way we seem to be invested in denigrating each other. The highest offices in our land. We hear trash talking. If you punch me, I'm going to punch you harder. As opposed to modeling the behavior we need in this country. When I crossed the Senate floor to hug John McCain, I went to back home and even people from my own side of the aisle were trashing me for hugging another human being. That's why in this election, I've got a unique resume. Nobody has one like me. I ran the state's largest city. I was a manager, chief executive of my state's largest city through an economic crisis of the Great Recession and transformed the outcome. We now are a city that, after 60 years of decline, are going through our biggest economic development boom. Our school system now is ranked number one in the country after being one of, in terms of wow. beat the odd schools, high poverty, high performance. We are a state, a state that brought in, a city that brought in supermarkets and food deserts and transformed our court systems with veterans courts and youth courts. I'm proud of being a chief executive, took on environmental issues, coalitions of mayors saying that if you're not gonna join back then, it was the Kyoto courts and Bush didn't join them, we're gonna take responsibility together. I'm proud of that. You add that resume to a guy that went to the United States Senate, and didn't go there to bash and beat down and point fingers at the other side. There are times I've had to fight and stand my ground, but I've also reached out to this side of the aisle. In fact, the only big piece of bipartisan <laughs> legislation to pass under this president was legislation I led from the Democratic side called the First Step Act for Criminal Justice Reform. So I'm, <laughs> I'm proud of the resume I put before you, and I'm happy to talk about the ideas and, and that I've learned from that to put into place, but I want to end my remarks to you opening with more of the spirit that I'm excited to bring to this campaign every single day, because I'm worried. I'm worried that this country has gotten to a point, forget partisan politics for the most, but people talk about the highest aspirations as a we're a tolerant society. That's not an aspiration. Go home tonight and tell somebody you live with that you tolerate them. <laughs> 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 
see if that's something that people are proud about. No! Those words at the end of our declaration, we're called to create a more beloved community where we make an unusual commitment to ourselves. And so I talk about all the time the values of love. Now don't tell me that love is a weak word. Don't tell me that in order to be strong, you gotta be mean. In order to be tough, you gotta be cruel. No, the strongest value in all of humanity is love. Love says that I see you with a more courageous empathy. Love says that I understand that we are all in this together. We may have come to this nation from different, different ships, but we're all in the same boat right now. From Native Americans, who's always been here. says that if your kids don't get a great public education, then my children are less for it. We lose from your kids' genius and artistry and, and innovations. If your family doesn't have health care, then I'm the less for it. Love understands that if we become a society like we are now that ignores mental illness and addiction and treats it with prison and jail, that hurts us all. Number one, it's the least, the most expensive way to treat those problems. But number two, it assaults the human dignity of the people struggling with those diseases. Love says we are one nation, and that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I want to take a step further. So we're going to have a debate with the Democratic Party. I, I walked into a, to in another prim, early primary state. I walked in, and right before I started my remarks, a guy put his arm around me. He sees his former tight end from Stanford University, high school All-American football player. The older I am, the better I was. <laughs> and he puts his arm around me. He thinks he's got this big former job, big guy, six foot three. He puts his arm around me. He says, man, you got to get in there and punch Donald Trump in the face. And I look at the guy and I go, yo, man, that's a felony. <laughs> you know, black guys like me, we can't get away with that. Man. <laughs> I said, do me a favor, take a seat and listen to me make the case of why the best strategy, not just for turning our country back to common purpose and common cause, but the best strategy for winning an election is love. Let me explain it to you. And I said to the guy, I go, uh, to the crowd, I said what I'm going to say to you, which is, look, Donald Trump wants us to fight him on his terms, on his turf. He wants us to get in the gutter and try to win a fight that he's very good at winning. That's not the call of our country right now. As a party, as Democrats, let's not talk to America about what we're against. Let's talk to America about what we're for. This country needs us to be a party that doesn't define ourselves about beating Republicans. This country needs us to be a party that talks about uniting Americans. This is a moment in our country where more than ever, we don't need to go to the low ground of hate. We need to take the high ground of love. <clears throat> they didn't beat Bull Connor in the 1960s. Those incredible marchers who, who beat the strongest sheriff. I mean, he brought dogs and fire hoses. They didn't beat them by bringing bigger dogs and bigger fire hoses. <laughs> no. Unarmed truth, unapologetic love. But, but what I want to convince you of is that this is our history. This is how we've done impossible things. By coming together with those bonds of a beloved community. I know people here are like rugged individualism and self-reliance. Well, rugged individualism didn't get us to the moon. It didn't map the human genome. It didn't beat the Nazis. It didn't beat Jim Crow. I am here. Literally, I'm going to explain this in a second. I am here because of the value of love. Let me explain. 1969. My mom and my dad, they met in Washington, D.C. My dad had the luck and good fortune to meet my mom. My mom had the charity and mercy to marry me. <laughs> and they, they, they get a promotion my, uh, uh, up to, 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 to New Jersey. In 1969, they're looking for homes, and they wanted to find the neighborhoods with the best public schools that happened to be white communities. And every time this black couple showed up to look at a home, the real estate agent would see it as a black couple and tell them the house was sold. And, and so they were distraught. They had to find some help. But they, what did they find? A group of people that met in a room like this, mostly white folks. There was a Republican and Democratic town, so there were people from both parties who met together for our values. And they said, in this community, we're not going to let this stand. And they put together this uh, sting operation where they would send my parents to look at a home and work with these lawyers to set it up. And as soon as my parents were told it was sold, a volunteer white couple would come right behind my parents and find out the house was still for sale. 
Well, the house I grew up in, my parents loved this home, but they were saying, I'm sorry, this house has already been sold. They leave, and the white couple, volunteer couple comes, and, and they pretend they love the home. They find out it's still for sale. They're like, this is an amazing home. Look at this molding. Oh, my gosh. The bathroom, they were like, oh, this grout could shout. It's amazing grout. <laughs> So they put a bid on the house, a proxy bid for my parents. The bid was accepted. Papers were drawn up. A closing was set in the real estate agent's office. And on the day of the closing, the white couple did not show up. My father did. And a volunteer lawyer, another white guy, they walk into the real estate agent's office. The real estate agent is shocked. He was waiting for the white couple. He was angry, upset. But he didn't capitulate. He had been caught in violation of housing law, federal and fair housing law, but he didn't give up. He was so angry he'd been caught that he stands up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face. And then he sings a dog on my dad. And every time my dad would tell me the story as I was growing up, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> Eventually my dad's looking at me and said, boy, I had to fight a pack of wolves to get you in this house. You better appreciate what you have. And you can't pay it back. You gotta pay it forward. I, I tell you, I thought I was something special. I went off to the Stanford University on a football scholarship. Yes, I got into Stanford because of a 4.0, 1,600, 4.0 yards, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600. <laughs> I gotta tell the truth, y'all. Get a graduate degree, go over to Oxford, study, come back, get my law degree in Yale. My dad's like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life is not about the degrees you get, it's about the service you give. Yeah. So what did I do? I moved to the inner city of Newark, New Jersey, joined with tenant activists. People had fought for my housing rights, I began fighting for theirs. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, I still live in that neighborhood right now. I'm the only person running for president, the only United States Senator that lives in the inner city community below the poverty line. Because I will not forget the people who put me in the fight. Well, eventually I go off to the Senate, and I do like lots of senators do that have a high sense of self-regard. I decided to write a book. And if your name is Booker, it's a lot of pressure. I wrote a book called United. It's my life purpose. We brought together tenant activists to take on slumlords. We beat them because we were united. We had a city that was known for crime and corruption. We turned it around because we were united. We created uncommon coalitions that produced uncommon results. I'm one of those junior senators that's passed lots of legislation through because I reached out to find common ground and brought people together to do it. Well, when I started researching the book, if you have a dad like mine, you gotta fact check stories. How big was the dog? <laughs> and so I go back to find the head of the Fair Housing Council from the 1960s. She was easy to find, Miss Lee Porter, because she was still the head of the Fair Housing Council in New Jersey. She's 92 years old. And now she doesn't represent black families. She represents same-sex couples. She represents Muslim families. She represents Americans with disabilities because to her, justice has no color. No race, no orientation. It is one justice. It is one nation. It is one love. And she confirms a lot of the facts, guys. It was not a pack of wolves there. And, but she says, you, in order to get the rest of the story, go to the lawyer that organized all those lawyers that were so essential to my success. I called the lawyer up and organized the other ones. He was 84 years old, retired judge. And he confirms a lot of the details for me, tells me the whole story. But then I get out almost confused because he tells me that his life was, he was struggling at that point in his life. He was trying to start a business, trying to support a young family, struggling. And then I had to ask him a question, well, wait a minute, sir. If you were struggling so hard with your business, why would you take out so much time to help strangers, to help black people move into your neighborhood? Especially at a time of fears of white flight and real estate prices going down. And what he told me is the, the theme I want to leave you with. He goes to me, I remember the moment I made the decision. And I said, the moment, he goes, the very moment. And I go, well, tell me what it was. And he said, I was sitting home one night watching TV. I do this a lot of nights, y'all, with my two best friends, Ben and Jerry. And, <laughs> but he says he's sitting there watching TV back in 1965. And some people in this room are old enough to know that back in 1965, we had three channels. And, and, and it wasn't this complicated stuff. No remote controls either, by the way. You had, to, you had to get up and turn the channel. We were hard working back then. Yes. Yeah. You had your kids. 
And, and by the way, at 11 o'clock, what would happen? TV would be done, it would go out. You had nothing to do. That's why we had higher birth rates back then. <laughs> and so he's watching TV, and because it was only three channels, I looked up the movie he was watching. The movie was called Judgment at Nuremberg. Oh, okay. And he says he's watching this movie about the aftermath of the Holocaust, and something happens. It happens all the time now, but rare back then. Breaking news happened. Now we have breaking news every five minutes. It's like Melania has a jacket. Breaking news. But this time they broke away an ongoing movie to show a bridge in Alabama. Yes. Called the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And these marchers had started in Selma, were marching towards Montgomery, but they got stopped on that bridge by Alabama state troopers that would not let them pass. And he's sitting at home in New Jersey, a thousand miles away, and he watches what happens. Those marchers get gassed. Tear gas shot at them. And then he says, in horror, as the marchers were running and scrambling, the state troopers charged in with their bully, billy clubs drawn and started beating them savagely over the head. One of those marchers has always been my hero. Now he is my colleague. His name is John Lewis. Was a very legal man, he says to me when he was telling me the story, he goes, Corey, I shed a little bit of blood on that bridge. And I said, Connor, said, no, you have your head cracked open, you bled profusely. He was knocked unconscious, had to be carried back to the church for safety. And so what does a white guy on a couch in New Jersey do when he sees that? A guy who pledges an oath, swears that this is going to be a nation of liberty and justice for all. What does he do? Does he just sit there and say, what a shame? No. Does he allow his inability to do everything to undermine his determination to do something? No. He gets up off his couch and starts thinking to himself, uh -huh, I can't afford a plane ticket to Alabama. Uh, I can't close my business for one day, but what can I do? I I'm determined to do the best I can with what I have, where I am. And so he decides that he can spend maybe an hour a week on pro bono work doing something for the cause of civil rights in the country. And he starts calling around New Jersey. Somebody in his community finds this young woman, Lee Porter, who's like, hallelujah, I need some legal help. He says they then go on and start working. And he starts getting other lawyers to join him. And suddenly they have this great operation going. Years past, 1969, he says he remembers the day he was handed a case file of this young couple trying to move from the south into his community. He says, I remember seeing the names on that case file, Carrie and Carolyn Booker. I talk about our connections. I talk about our power. I talk about the choice that every American has to make every day to accept things as they are or take responsibility for changing. Mm -hmm. Look at the connections between us. Why are we here? I am literally here right now because the marchers on a bridge stood up for patriotism. And what is patriotism but love of country? And you cannot love your country unless you love your fellow countrymen and women. And, and I tell you, these marchers on a bridge stood up for love and didn't even make it to their destination. They were beaten back. But just by standing up for the right thing, they released an energy that instantaneously left a thousand miles and changed the heart of one man on a couch in New Jersey who would then get up and go to work and change the destiny of a generation not yet born. I would not be here. I would not be America's fourth popularly elected African American in the Senate ever. I would not be running for President of the United States of America if it wasn't for this power of love, of our connections one to another. And so what are we going to do in this election? Well, are we going to let it be? <laughs> are we going to let it be about one man and one office? No. Is it, are we going to let it be about what we're against no. or what we're for? No. Can we lift the dialogue and not let people make this about a combat between tribes, but make it about one nation still scrambling to be who we say we are, to make sure that this next generation is better than we are? talking about this every day in this election. Regardless of the outcome, I want my party to rise. And I'll tell you this, if we make this election about 
our dreams and our love for one another, if we make this a nation about justice for all, if we make this election about those things, then this nation's tomorrows will be better than our yesterdays. And the next generation of our children will astonish us. If we make it about these things, I promise you, America, we will rise. Thank you.